Hi there, this is Jennifer Shepard, also known as the Lipstick Mystic, the Crazy Cat Lady, and the Rantosaurus, who tends to rant from her office, especially when she's had a glass of white wine in the evenings. Although usually I tend to rant in my blog, which involves an excessive amount of frantic typing and carpal tunnel and grunting and groaning. And I think tonight I'm going to try something a little different, which is to make a recording and try to upload it to my YouTube channel so that you can visit my little corner of YouTubia, I guess, if you were to call YouTube a, a nation state, and access my mad ramblings online. I think some of you may have learned this from looking at my blog or reading my material that I've posted all over the interwebs in the past, but I live in New Jersey. Many people think that New Jersey is the armpit of the USA, and there are certainly parts of it that are armpits. I'm talking about you, Newark, Camden, Elizabeth. These are places when you pass them on the train, the stench of human misery, darkness, fear, and depravity assails your nostrils and makes you never want to get on the train again, even if you're going somewhere nice like uh, the Ritz-Carlton in Manhattan. Um, but I actually live in a part of the state that is all rolling countryside, and it's just gorgeous. It's, um, I always tell people it's a little bit like a masterpiece theater production from PBS, you know, where there's all these gentlemen farm estates that are worth millions of dollars, often with these gorgeous stone buildings. Like, there'll often be a stone farmhouse from the 1700s, and then sometimes there'll be additions onto that property uh, set up in the Victorian era, up to the modern age. So you have all these really interesting buildings that have been created over many generations and many hundreds of years, in addition to beautiful forests and rolling countryside. And so you have a lot of people who keep a weekend um, property, come down from New York or from Philadelphia, because I'm about two hours from New York City and about an hour outside of Philadelphia. I live near the Delaware River, which is very beautiful. Um, all up and down the New Jersey side of the river, and also the Pennsylvania side, you find these lovely little river towns, which were often founded by artists, sometimes anarchists. They're very liberal, they're very gay-friendly, they're very progressive areas, and up and down the river there's just this sense of um, picturesque beauty, artistic kind of fun and quirkiness with lots of amazing craftsmen and craftswomen and artists of all kinds. And then you also have, as you come back from the river, just really beautiful farm properties. So there's not a lot of um, typical suburbia with uh, suburban developments with house after house after house on small acreage. We're a lot more spread out. Where I live is just outside of a river town, and I've watched the river town that I love next door get flooded two, three, I've lost track now. I think it's been at least two major floods since I've lived out here. And that's when the water, usually from way up, up river, gets engorged and washed downstream, and then suddenly your post office is wet and you can't get into town because everything's all flooded. and many, many local businesses and, and residents really suffer, uh, can't even get into their homes for a week, you know, power is out, um, all kinds of problems. We're not right on the river, but we suffer from those same things too. This time last year, and I'm recording this, uh, today is um, uh, November 19th, 2012. Um, we just came out of Hurricane Sandy, which was this horrible Frankenstorm that just happened a couple of weeks ago. And we were very lucky that our river towns didn't flood this time. But last year, right around Halloween, we had uh, a flooding storm that was really quite awful that really shut things down. Um, out here where we are, we lost power for about seven days in that storm. And we've lost power in past storms for like five or six days. This time around with Hurricane Sandy, we lost power for 11 days, which was a real treat. But given the way that things have been going in recent years, we had uh, had a little bit of foresight, and we ended up getting an extra propane tank, which allowed us to store extra propane to power um, a really large generator that we use here at the house. But even so, the things that were going on with this hurricane, oh my gosh, I actually took a bunch of notes the other day, like eight or nine pages, and I'm like, I don't know if this should become a report or a book. I mean, the working title is basically a hundred things to think about before the lights go out. 
because wherever you live in the wor world right now, we're seeing, unfortunately, these increased incidents of earthquakes, tsunamis, oh, you know, the oil spill in the Gulf, the, the horrible nuclear disaster in Japan, um, these super storms that are really freaky that would never have happened were our weather systems not being manipulated. And unfortunately, you too, wherever you live in the world, you could end up being, being in a situation where you don't have power. And believe me, it doesn't take very long <laughs> after the lights go out before you start like every moment of your thoughts becomes about planning your next survival mood move and we of course were very lucky we had a lot of trees down in our area but we could physically get down our driveway and get out of the house through one of our back roads there were a couple of stores the grocery stores that had power there were a couple of gas stations that were using generators and able to sell gas but not too far from us there were gas shortages People lined up for six hours to get gas. They needed the gas to put in a gas can so that they could power their gas generators to at least try to get a little heat or a little hot water in their homes. And um, it was really crazy. And even our wealthy friends who would go to hotels found themselves almost living like gypsies. They couldn't get into their houses quite often because uh, trees were down, electrical problems were going on. They had no backup power, so they were freezing cold in their houses. So they would try to find hotels where they could go. And you'd think, well, you know, money means that you never really have any problems, right? No matter how bad it is, you have more choices than someone who doesn't have money. But that was definitely not true. Uh, I have uh, one couple that we're friends with who are easily multimillionaires. She's basically an heiress. She's a very sweet lady. She works also, but she is an heiress, and she has a lot of money. And her husband is a hedge fund manager, very, very wealthy, formerly worked at, at Bear Stearns in New York and now has his own hedge fund. And they live in a gorgeous rural country home, not that different than ours, um, just about 45 minutes away from us here in New Jersey. And they were struggling to actually get into various hotels because everybody there were 2.4 million people in New Jersey without power with this storm. And although the news pretty much just showed people who live at the beach whose horrible devastation and you know their houses were destroyed, it was quite awful. And of course, the outer boroughs of New York City, Staten Island, Coney Island, you know, Queens, there were so many areas where it was just, we didn't have um, the ability to look at TV during the storm, but I imagine that uh, the footage was all just about that wreckage at those shorelines. But what was really going on for most of us was sort of quiet desperation and panic. And even if you had money, you know, like my friends were having problems finding places to stay. They ended up staying with friends. They ended up staying in a hotel like for a couple nights, not realizing that the hotels were being very strict about schedules. So if you called up and said, uh, we'd like to book a room tonight, the hotel would say, OK, if they had space available. But if you suddenly found that you needed to stay three or four more days because your power still wasn't on at home, they would kick you out after the 24 hours because you'd only reserved your room for 24 hours and there were lots of people waiting for those rooms. And this was happening in high-end hotels, um, middle-range hotels that were kind of um, moderately expensive and also very cheap and, um, you know, kind of cockroach-ridden hotels that you really probably wouldn't want to stay in unless you had to. You couldn't find places to stay. We had a, a radio station here in New Jersey, 101.5, which uh, is normally kind of a talk radio thing. And, you know, Joey Botafuco and Gina Botafuco come on at lunch for a couple hours, and they take calls from everybody in New Jersey, and they complain about, hey, you know, there's taxes going on in New Jersey, or Chris Christie, we don't like him, or maybe we love Chris Christie, he's a great guy, he likes pizza. You know, you kind of get like the average Joe calling in and, and uh, offering opinions. I tend not to like the show because there's just so much complaining going on. But to give this station credit, they changed over their whole programming format during the storm and became the only clearinghouse you could find anywhere on the radio dial, allowing New Jersey listeners to call in with uh, requests for help or offers to give help. I mean, we'd hear stories of someone who's a professional nurse or caregiver to some elderly people who were housebound because trees had fallen down all around their area and they couldn't get out. 
Plus, they weren't very mobile anyway because they were on oxygen tanks or they had lots of illnesses. And these caregivers would go in each day to help them. They couldn't even get to the houses because the trees were down. Sometimes the power companies would stop by and say, well, you have to get those trees out of here. We can't remove them. It's on private property. It's your responsibility. And these poor old people, you know, would be told by the tree services that it's going to be $1,900 to remove one tree from their backyard. What if they had three trees down? There were just these horrible cases, and often these people would be on oxygen tanks. They don't have power to operate their oxygen tanks. It's really cold. We had this horrible cold snap here where it went from, we were having 60 degree weather before the storm. Hurricane Sandy hit and suddenly we're down to 22 degrees at night and 40 degrees during the day and you're suddenly very cold and very aware of uh, trying to find heat wherever you can find it, whether it's a shaft of sunlight or turning on the generator for 10 minutes, you know, trying to find that. And most people in our, our state did not have backup power. And people with dependency on power, like those who needed oxygen tanks, were really in dire straits. And 101.5 would uh, take calls from like really nice people who ran tree service removal businesses, and they would call in and volunteer to help those people. And the radio station people would hook them up so that the people who needed help could get help, which was a lovely thing to see. But I never once... <laughs> heard anybody really say, oh great, the Red Cross is coming to help us, or oh great, FEMA is really doing a great job. FEMA, which is supposed to help displace people during natural disasters, like the Hurricane Katrina mess, where they really came under fire, was doing things like giving housing vouchers to people whose homes had been destroyed, and saying, you can take these vouchers to a hotel, and you can stay there because we'll pay for your lodgings. We'll give them, um, you know, you just give them this voucher and we'll pay for your stay. Well, people in New York State and in New Jersey were going to hotels and saying, I've got this voucher from FEMA. Um, I'm supposed to be able to stay here if you've got an open room. And the hotels were saying, hey, wait a minute. We're not going to be doing this. It's payment up front, bub. You know, we're not going to take no voucher from the government. We don't expect them to pay us. So there was a lot of displaced people, you know, and what was really sad is all the elderly and the disabled and the pets, people with pets were really in a really tough situation. They were often just having to go drive somewhere with their animals and sleep in their car because hotels wouldn't take pets. Uh, they couldn't find a place to go. So there was all this, you know, we're still in the recovery from this because our power just came on. Well, we had power off for 11 days. I guess it's been on now for about a week. And the toll for everyone, even, you know, like us, we didn't really suffer much other than the, the inconvenience of it all. It still created a lot of work, work hours that were lost. And we saw restaurants in our area, you know, have to just throw away a couple of weeks worth of food because they couldn't open their doors. They didn't have any power to open up. The people who worked there couldn't go to work. All my friends who have kids, their kids were home for over a week because the schools didn't have power. The schools were all closed. So the parents couldn't go to work. The daycare facilities weren't open because they didn't have power. So it created this real log jam of problems. And then the post office wasn't really operating terribly efficiently because trees were down so many places and deliveries for mail were impossible. So you didn't get your paycheck in the mail, you know. Or if you were getting it by direct deposit, you couldn't go verify it because you didn't have power and you didn't have internet and you couldn't fire up your computer. So all these things kind of built to a head. And it wasn't just the people at the shore or the outer boroughs of New York, which I think was all people really saw on the news about this whole crisis. It was the day-to-day -day weirdness that came up for those of us who found that they couldn't go get gas to power their generator because the gas shortages were crazy. And even if you have a propane generator, which we also have, the propane company couldn't get supplies from their suppliers because those suppliers couldn't drive on the roads because the trees were down. So everybody was really behind. And when it comes down to managing for yourself in a crisis for 11 days straight to make sure that you have power, it all gets very real very fast. So my heart goes out to everybody who was affected by Hurricane Sandy and who is still being affected by it. And a lot of it's just, 
you know, the average person who maybe couldn't have gone to work for a week or two and isn't going to be paid for those lost hours. Or the employer who lost business during those times and who is now going to maybe have to cut costs and maybe even have to lay somebody off because they lost so much money. I mean, these are real world issues that happen in a crisis like this. Even in a place as abundant and in some ways very lovely uh, as the United States, which is still a great country where you can express sovereignty and independence in, in a way that is harder in other countries, as much as we like to always slam the U.S. for all its many problems, and I think we should keep it under scrutiny and uh, give voice when we feel that there are problems. It's still a place where the average person has more of a chance to grow and expand and to discover and to create in a way that is not true so in so many other places in this, this crazy messed up world. But there is a complete collapse of infrastructure going on. I've been through three of these storm systems now, and I have seen how even when phone companies, utility companies like power people and cable people all converge on an area to try to fix down lines or problems with transformers. They will often mark a ticket as complete, a work order as complete, even if they couldn't fix the problem. And what happens is you have to constantly call these companies and say, no, the guy came out, but he wasn't able to fix it. But he just told you that he did come, he did complete his time to check it out but the work order is not complete, it's still open, and we need another guy to come to do the next phase of the repair. Last year, we had no phone lines for three and a half weeks, and no cable internet or cable TV for three and a half weeks, and our power was out for seven days. And that also became a huge crisis for just trying to get things done. So I just want to mention all this stuff is sort of going on. I'm sort of gradually coming out of several weeks of bizarreness. And I do have a book coming out shortly, which I'm going to talk about in a separate broadcast. I do hope that you'll join me for a discussion of some of the interesting things I'm going to be exploring in my book on time traveling and learning how to uh, hold your energy in a specific way so that you can navigate down a much better timeline or a happier probability than you might think is possible. That's the, the main theme of my new book, which it's coming out shortly, sometime over the next four weeks. I'm a little bit delayed with publication because of the storm and all the craziness here, but please hang on, and I hope to see you uh, hanging on to my every word, <laughs> or at least checking out my website, which is lipstickmystic.com. This is Jennifer Shepard. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.